Hello, Night Nation. I'm Trey Strolko from the Sons of Fuse. You have joined by Eric Lopez of the Black and Gold Banner. Welcome to Around the Kingdom. Elo, hello. Hello, Trace. I'm glad you're still with us, my friend. Coming up on the fastest show on UCF Around. UCF's got a new quarterback in the room. We got some competition. We're also going to talk softball, hosting the three-time defending national champions, and how Trace nearly would not be with us if he didn't move slightly on a home run ball on Sunday in the outfield. Find out more about that coming up on this edition of Around the Kingdom. Uh, you exaggerate a little too much. Before we get going, let's welcome in the third member of our team, Adam Eaton from the Sons of UCF. Keeps an eye on the clock, keeps us on our toes. Adam, hello. Gents, greetings. Unlike the NBA playoffs, I hope this episode is not a blowout tonight. <laughs> Good luck, Trace. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Adam. Boom, City Elo breaking before we record. Miami quarterback transfer uh, Jacari Brown commits to UCF. We got two minutes on the clock for this, Elo. I got two questions for you. Do we have a bit of a quarterback controversy now with this addition? And maybe the bigger question, what does it mean for quarterback development? A couple of young guys on the bench there. Uh, you know, what, what does it mean for quarterback development if you keep going into the portal and snagging quarterbacks? Your reaction? Well, I think, number one, no, I don't think there's a quarterback controversy this year. I think Brown is an insurance policy. He's their experienced backup quarterback to say if something were to happen to K.J. Jefferson. So I will answer that part first. Number two, though, it's a fair question. Welcome to college football 2024. Teams are going to grab quarterbacks that have experience and grab them. And I'm sure Brown's coming in thinking, hey, I got a chance to start, if not this year, definitely next year. Uh, we have a young quarterback. And I'll tell you what this means, Trace. The next time, I don't know what the date is in December where we talk about signing day and, ooh, that's a four-star. He's in for an official visit. Oh, he's in the stands. You know what I say? I don't give a bleep. Don't give a bleep because it doesn't matter anymore, apparently. It's not like the old days. You could develop guys three, four years, Trace. Unfortunately, I think those days are gone. So please spare me on who's in the stands. Oh, let's make sure we show this guy a good time because it won't matter because they're only going to be here for a cup of coffee, it seems like. Well, it got to strike a balance between recruiting the high schools, and that has taken a big hit with the portal. But no we thought, and we talked about this, that you know, with Timmy McLean entering the portal, who would be that experienced backup uh, behind KJ Jefferson? Yeah, you, you get a little more of a veteran guy here, I guess, in in Brown. But I just don't know what it does to your quarterback room, and when you develop these guys, it, it, which of these guys now is is the next to enter the portal that uh, it watches in defense of the defense of the coaching staff. You guys, you can move on anytime you want now with yearly transfers, so you have to have depth at the quarterback room. And unfortunately, we're just going to have a revolving door at this position, not just here, but all over the place in college football. That's just is it a doing. quarterback every year now? The starting quarterback is going to be a one-year quarterback. I really do question if we will ever see a quarterback here start multiple years. And, and I really do question that right now, Trace. Maybe, I'm, maybe it's just – the cynical side of me, we'll see if things settle down, but I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that that's not the case. Uh, all right, well, turning attentions to – there was a thing called the NFL draft took place. Trace, I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, a little bit. Notable, Javon Baker drafted in the fourth round by the New England Patriots. Tylen Grab uh, Grable, the offensive lineman, win the sixth round to the Buffalo Bills. Uh, Trace, who do you think will have the better NFL career? Put me down for Tylen Grable. I think he is uh, joining a, a better run organization right now in the Buffalo Bills. And I think oh. he'll have a longer NFL career with more success. Prove me wrong, Javon Baker, for all of his talent, his speed, his spectacular catches. I watched him drop a few as well for the Knights. And let's see what he does with a, a new look offense in New England. Uh, easier. There's more time to develop an offensive lineman. You could be on the roster for sure. I'm going to go with Baker, but there's an asterisk because it depends on that the Patriots get the right guy in Drake May. If he's the right guy, if Drake May is a franchise-type quarterback, then Javon Baker is going to benefit from that because Lord, New, New, New England needs wide receivers. So I think there's an opportunity for him, whether he takes advantage of it, is he Gabe Davis? Is he Tranquan Smith? I don't know, but there's a better opportunity for him to succeed, especially if they hit on Drake May. If he's the goods, then that I think I'll go with Baker. 
Speaking of that, what are the odds, by the way? What was it? The top six picks uh, were quarterbacks. What are the odds that they all pan out, right? Somebody in that bunch is not going to make it. It could be May. Well, and the bad news for Javon Baker is the recent history would suggest that if you're a North Carolina Tar Heel quarterback in the first round draft, you're not going to be successful. Sam Howell, Mitch Trubisky. So uh, that's the, probably the one you would bet on to maybe not be successful, which, again, would impact. Javon Baker, in my opinion. But I'm going to go Baker because I could see him being this nice career. Everybody's going to be like, man, he was great over that, but we'll see. But I wish them both uh, well. Immediately following that draft, the free agency frenzy uh, got underway. A uh, bunch of UCF guys uh, inking deals. Uh, which of them, Elo, uh, John Rice Plumley in Pittsburgh, Jason Johnson and Alec Collar in Dallas, Traymond Morris Brash with the Chargers and Sean Peterson Jr.? with the Buccaneers, which of those do you think has the best shot of making a final NFL roster this fall? I don't think any of them will. Uh, None. I think, no, I don't. I think that the, their, their future is probably in the CFL or whatever spring football edition gets developed next by the rock after the UFL goes bye-bye in the next year or two. Mm. Um, but, I, but I'll play the game. I'll answer the question. I'm going to go with Tremont Morris Brash. Because the Chargers have a lot of cap issues, and he might get an opportunity in the defensive line if he can rush the passer. That You can't put a price on that. So I think there will be an opportunity for him to make that roster because there's going to be some you know cuts and things. I could see him there in the defensive line making the roster. I don't think any of them will. Uh, I've already read talk that uh, John Rice Plumley it may need to uh, be a move to wide receiver. A friend of mine, Scott, big Steelers fan, said, hey, don't rule him out for QB3 in Pittsburgh. He's a big Steelers fan, so he would know. Um, how about I'm going to go with Sean Peterson Jr. because if the Buccaneers were really scouting it, at what point did you hear his name come up at all in any conversation? The Bucs wanted him. So, hey, how about I'm going to roll the dice that he makes uh, uh, at least a practice squad roster for the Bucs? That's wild. Well, practice squad, I could see a couple of these guys make a practice squad. I don't think they'll be on, like, the full, you know, 53-man roster opening day, but certainly I think Brash would be my pick for that. Hey, that was a weird pick. That caught everybody off guard, didn't it? I mean, I don't think that was in anybody's radar, like you mentioned. I, I'm trying to remember. Did he go to the uh, pro day in, in Texas uh, as part of that? I don't remember. Yeah, I'll be like honest. There were times, guys there. There was times I forgot he played here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the NFL draft is weird. Some would argue maybe it's too long. Maybe that's why you have picks like this. But perhaps there's some extra credit to do to UCF. A couple former Knights, Matt Lee, seventh-round draft pick to the Bengals. Tatum Bethune, seventh-round pick to the 49ers. Does UCF, Knight Nation, claim these picks here, Trace? I saw a split on social media and message boards about that. I think you claim them and take credit for them if they played the majority of their time with you as opposed to the team that they went to. That's how I think you get to claim credit for it. This is going to be an interesting topic because we're going to get more and more of this, right, as time goes on. it's I think it's case by case. It's a timeshare situation. It's kind of like what's happened to starting pitching in Major League Baseball now where it's by staff, by committee, openers, you get case by case. No, I don't think you'd take clip. They didn't finish their career, un you know, unless they were a part of a big team that helped them win a championship or something like that. But neither of those two guys were, like, helped them get to the New Year's Six Bowl. I'm going to say no because they left. So I'm going to say no. Give them – give the other schools those credits. Although I do think Bethune and Lee can stay in, in an NFL roster. Let me ask you this question. Uh, a lot of what-ifs here, but picture that these two guys don't leave – Oh. And then first year with UCF in the Big 12, do they still get drafted? Is their stock higher, lower with the UCF brand name in its first year in the Big 12 as opposed to certainly Florida State had a good season uh, with Tatum Bethune there? Uh, or do they land about the same spot? That's a wonderful question. I'm not Mel Kuyper, unfortunately. So he would be the one that would know or, Jer you know, Maybe Adam can book Mel Kuyper for Sons of UCF and get the answer to that. I will say this. I think Bethune benefited from Florida State. He made a lot of big plays there. They were high profile because they were in the mix for the national title. I'm not sure, Matt Lee, that made a big difference, although Miami certainly pumped him up. I'm going to say mix, 50-50. I think it did help Bethune. 
go to FSU. I don't know if that helped Lee necessarily would have made a difference. Hmm. Once a night, always a night, Elo. Except when they're not. Uh, maybe, maybe. Chris Vanini uh, sharing on uh, with the Athletic sharing on his social media. Roger Goodell was on the Pat McAfee show uh, talking about the changes in college football, and uh, he was asked, "Could the NFL ever consider absorbing college football, bundling it together?" In which the NFL commissioner said, "I don't see that at least today. Um, I don't see that in the future." But he didn't say no, did he there? Uh, I don't know why the NFL would want to take on that expense. Let it play out the way it is with the uh, all of the money flying around. And the, NCAA. the NFL's got for all of the UFL and before that XFL, USFL, these other leagues, right? Uh, proving ground for guys trying to get back into the NFL. They got the best minor league system that they don't pay for right now uh, in college football. I'll agree 99% of that. The only way I do think they could get involved is the college football playoff is expanding. There are sat- certain Saturdays that they might try to get at the expense of the NFL. The NFL is like, whoa, not so fast. I think the maybe the quarterfinal round is going to be the same weekend as the NFL. Maybe the NFL helps out college football a little bit. In return, college football says we will not touch – any of your NFL weekends, Saturdays, Sundays, we'll play on Wednesday nights, baby, in return to help. That's the only way I can see the NFL helping out. Otherwise, you're right. Why bother? You already got the farm system for free. NFL, the big behemoth there, right? NBA had owned Christmas Day for a number of years. And the NFL said not so fast, right? Christmas falls midweek uh, this season. The NFL going to stage a game there. They used to get out of the way of high school Friday football. They're going to schedule that international game. They don't care who comes up against them. It might be in the NCAA's best interest to figure out a way to play nice with the NFL because they are not going to win head-to-head battles with the NFL. Right, and I think you're seeing that with the TV contract with the playoff. I do think that played a role. I think that's why ESPN is going to end up probably owning all of it because the other networks, CBS, Fox, they don't want to tick off the NFL. So I I do think that's a factor to raise All right, time to turn back to Adam for some silliness, as if, though, a lot of this show wasn't that already. (laughs) Thanks, Trace. I appreciate that. All right, here we go. NFL draft, obviously, as you mentioned this uh, this past weekend. Elo, I'll start with you on this question. Do you think UCF, from an NFL perspective, is known more for wide receivers or for defensive backs? So just for context, wide receivers in the NFL, Brandon Marshall, Mike Sims-Walker, Rashad Perryman, Gabe Davis, Trey Cohen-Smith, Sean Jefferson, just to name a few. Defensive backs, Sante Samuel, Jacoby Glenn, um, uh, Sha- uh, Shaquille Griffin, Atari Bigby, Clayton Gathers, Richie Grant, just to name a few. Is UCF more wide receiver you, Eric, or DBU? It's a fantastic question. That's the two positions of strength that UCF's produced the best, in my opinion, to the NFL talent. But I'm going to say defensive backs. Uh, Sante Samuel, three-time, what, Super Bowl champion with the New England Patriots. I mean, Mike Hughes was a first-round draft pick after the 2017 UCF season recently. Uh, You find UCF defensive backs all over the place, you know, drafted every year, it seems like, certainly. So I'm going to say UCF secondary. Can I go off the board, Adam, and say that they're known for long snappers? You you don't like (laughs) playing Adam's – you don't go by Adam's (laughs) rules, do you? There's two. I mean, there's two long snappers. Yeah, but there's only 32 of them, <laughs> so they've got some guys there. But I will, uh, I'll go opposite uh, Elo on this and say uh, wide receiver. You, uh, they've had success with the position, uh, but I'm not sure that across the NFL that they think of UCF as being dominant in any of these positions. Really? Wow! <laughs> yeah. Jeez. It's not what I asked, but okay. All right. Trace, this one to you. Obviously, Eric mentioned the near-death experience this weekend. Both of you two have been veterans covering sporting events for a long time. You've been on the field, on the court. So, Trace, I'll start with you. What's the closest you've ever come to being injured while covering a sporting event? Well, if you were listening to Elo on social media, he thought I nearly got murdered uh, by a softball home run out at UCF on uh, Sunday. Um at some point, uh, I don't. I don't know that I've ever come especially close, uh, but certainly uh, being down on the uh, field for football, you, you got to keep your eyes uh, open. You know, you're not usually in a sideline situation, but I'd say there's probably. I can't remember a specific time, but uh, a pass into the end zone, and you know that last couple minutes when you're allowed to be uh, on the field by the end zone, something close that way, but never close enough where I, uh, feared for my life. Like Elo apparently thinks I did at the softball game. 
I'm going to say it was Sunday. I'm hanging out with Trace, <laughs> who's talking to a female fa- a friend who, uh, of his, or a, who, no, a female that you met. Both of you hey. are Cubs fans yeah. talking about the fellow Cubs season. Next thing we know, there's a line drive ball hit by Kenzie, Kenzie Hansen of Oklahoma. It's headed towards Trace, and I go yell out, move, Trace, move. And he moves away slightly at the end. I moved as well because that ball was coming for me as well. Thankfully, we both moved. It came out a young lady, a girl got the ball. But that's a pretty bad situation. I did have a scenario at a basketball game where the basketball drilled my laptop and shredded it to pieces one time. By the way, Elo, this is all I heard. Move, Trey. It was all in slow motion, Elo. I feel like I heard it near this experience, and then a little girl got the got the ball. So I'll circle back to that later. Elo, this one's for you. Thinking of the current UCF coaches that are on, on campus, which one coach do you think is most likely – to be elected to the UCF Hall of Fame? Current coaches, I would say Sidney Ball Malone, UCF softball. Let him do a regional win, hosted the regional, got to a super regional, three straight 40 win seasons, has a chance to perhaps lead the program to four NCAA tournaments already in straight years, never happened before in program history. I think Lenny can regard her as one of the top young coaches in the sport of softball, so I'll say her. Hmm. I think there are several that will be uh, in, in in the Hall of Fame uh, at some point. Sure. Uh, put me down for uh, for Johnny Dawkins. Uh, I think it's been well documented between Elo and I and this show and our respective outlets that uh, uh, he has uh, led UCF to the most success that it's had in uh, men's basketball. So I think at some point uh, he will get in. All right, last one, Trace. This one starts with you and a uh, first ever here on Around the Kingdom Silly Game, Elo. You don't get to answer this question. This goes to Trace and Trace only. Mm. Trace, our good friend Eric broadcast his 600th game this weekend for UCF softball. Does Eric Lopez deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, Trace? Oh, you know, I was having this conversation with someone. uh, We were talking about the possibilities in that area. And uh, I think uh, Elo's tenure already amassing those 600 uh, broadcast games, more than that now, right, with a couple more games added to it. I definitely think uh, with the longevity and the tenure and being as recognizable, especially with this sport, I could see it. Yes. Ela, well, congrats to you. I'm not going to ask you to answer that question, but any any thoughts, any ruminations on 600 broadcasts for UCF softball? I've been very overwhelmed by all the feedback and reaction. The team obviously surprised me on the broadcast with former players sending their congrats. It's been uh, pretty remarkable, and uh, I, I – I can't believe it was 600 games. It's been a long time. It's uh, I, but I don't trade it. So hopefully there's a few hundred more, but we'll see how long that lasts. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment. Just By the way, when do they me. recognize you again? Is it at 750? You got to get to a thousand. <laughs> What's the next number? I'll make the decisions. I didn't make the decision on this one. They decided it for me. So what are you going to do? All right, as long as we, way, Trace and I are mentioned in the Hall of Fame speech. It's all I care. I want to be in the Hall of Fame speech. Okay. I'm glad it wasn't at 599 on Saturday. No, yeah, although that was wow, that's that's a tough game. Are we gonna do a I Suns? Could, we should do a Suns Hall of Fame. Suns Hall of Fame. You wouldn't have had the uh, the six hundredth on Sunday with it going to ESPN. <laughs> would not have. Yeah. Would have had to wait a while. All right, things happen for a reason. Things were happened meant for a reason, Trace. If I if I was broadcasting that Sunday game, maybe you still we would not be doing this show with me. It'd be me and Adam. I would be long gone. All right, Elo, kick it off. We got to speed things up now. Oh. All right, so we got maybe a G5 playoff going happening here? That's the big question, Trace. Uh, Mike Oresco saying, it's quote, as is always concerned that it would separate us from the big guys. What do you think about Heather Dinich talking about the spring meetings, about the idea of a G5 postseason tournament? What's the TV dollars? How much are the networks willing to pay for this uh, G5 playoff. If the dollars are higher than what they could get with scraps from the bowl games and such, uh, I could see them considering it because it's a survival issue for them. That divide, we've already talked about the divide, Elo, between Big Ten, SEC, and the rest, right? And it's growing every single year. Imagine being the commissioner of Conference USA or the MAC. You might take some dollars if it was an interesting enough TV network decision. You saw the way Fox is counter-programmed against ESPN with its big noon Saturday. Would a network take a flyer and see if they could stage something? Because there are some recognizable brands still left uh, in that uh, in that group. Well, I agree. And plus, a G5 playoff game might be more interesting than, you know, uh, 
blank bowl game, you know, in Albuquerque. I think that might benefit there and maybe get, you know, if you're a G5, you might as well try to make some extra money because you're not going to make it in this current playoff. But uh, it's funny, Trace. I remember when you were in a previous platform many years ago, you scoffed at this idea and called it the cartel trying to take over things. How do you feel about it now, Trace? I don't think you have any evidence of those particular comments. <laughs> I think they're very <laughs> I told you last week that I acknowledged a bit of hypocrisy on this issue. UCF's in the club now. I'm a little less concerned about fighting the battle. But all right, let's move on, Elo. A left out is the topic of this next quick segment. Uh, Big East, Big 12, men's basketball challenge. Two years in a row, no UCF. What does it say about the brand of UCF men's basketball as far as the networks are concerned, the TV contracts, and both of these respective leagues? Says to me that there's too many. There's a lot of teams in the Big 12 and the Big East, and uh, we didn't make the cut. That's uh, they want marquee value, and you know UCF has uh, not a basketball pr- uh, powerhouse. I uh, hate to break it to people, so it's that's what I think. All right, for all the booms in men's basketball, uh, football, men's basketball is quietly <laughs> reassembling its roster. Uh, the Monday breaking news, a LaSalle transfer, Rokas, uh, I don't know how you say his last name, J-O-C-I-U-S, Rokas uh, breaks the news himself, by the way, scoops all of the, the media. These kids are just releasing this information themselves when they uh, ink somewhere in the transfer portal. A 6'10 sophomore, Elo, started 27 to 33 games for LaSalle, averaging 8.5 points, 5.4 rebounds, a block, shot 60% from two, 39% from three. You like it? You're sold on, like it on paper. I love- I wish he would have announced it here on Around the Kingdom exclusively. Can we make that happen? <laughs> Can make that happen. Can make it happen. All right. So we got a prop bet, don't we? We got to do here. We're tied. I'm calling foul on this prop bet already, by the way. Why? I've got, a, I, I've got an asterisk. Well, you read the prop bet, and I'll tell you why. I think I think I should get credit for the win. No, your good friend Mike put the prop bet. It's up to him. But what do you have a problem with Mike's bear? Bears clock began? You know, did, did it match that? To, Which uh, Would a game... A game lasts longer than NFL first round. Here's, yeah, I know the key word there is game. Yes, but between the recognition of all of the seniors at softball <laughs> and the lengthy <laughs> delay for the post game, I thought our waits for Scott Calabrese late nights on Zoom back in 2020 were long. We were there for hours, Elo. It was hours. a little while, but that's not what Mike referenced. It was the I NFL know. draft started against the game. I know. I know. I'm just saying it was a long time. All right, you've you've evened it up at yeah. 13, 13. Do you have one? Because if not, I've, I'm going to throw one out at you. Go for it. All right, what's the final runtime of this show? <laughs> We're <at> over 22 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> give me the exact runtime. Whoever's closest, you can't no, go here. over. I'm going to give you a, no, I'll give you a better prop bet. Will there be a half <laughs> inning of UCF baseball longer than this show? Well, how, how, when are we going to measure that? They're on the road. Uh, when are we going? When are we? No. What do you mean we're going to be on the road? Do you mean how are we going to measure that? You watch the game and count how long I it took. Get I, Michael. I get Michael on it. Michael will do My, it. Michael. Michael. <laughs> yes. And he's uh, going to watch every yes. pitch. Yes. It. I'll go. Yes. I'll say no. You'll say no. All right. Let's segue to baseball. Elo Knights drop two of three at home to Cincinnati particularly painful, was Friday, blow a 4-1 lead. Three in the seventh for the Bearcats, five in the eighth. They lose 9-4. What's going on here, Elo? They need to be in that top 10 to make the Big 12 tournament. Now they're in a little bit of a fight between 10 and 11. Well, and the issue is their RPI dropped to 33, which is still pretty good. But if you look at their schedule move coming up here, there are no real, like, great teams out there. Houston's at the bottom of the league. Baylor's at the bottom of the league. I think they got North Florida. They still got Bethune. So while that's good news in that those are all winnable games, the bad news is if you drop a couple of some of those games, you're going to drop in the RPI, the non-conference schedules, I think from 90-something. So they're on the bubble. You mentioned the bubble for the Big 12 tournament, top 10 make it. And the bullpen is leaking, Trace. I've been worried about this. Centala and Kramer, do you do they get overused? I'm seeing some leakage there, Trace. Well, look at it on Friday. Uh, Kyle Kramer couldn't get the job done. Neither could Chase Centala. Uh, four hits on Friday, by the way, Elo. Where's the offense? Andrew Sundin back. Got to find his rhythm and his groove. 
Uh, they're going to need his bat, but I think uh, <laughs> it's 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 tough down the stretch here. Uh, they got a couple more road series. They're two and seven in Big Twelve road games, right? They got swept at Oklahoma, swept at West Virginia. Going to have to win some games on the road down the stretch, and then they got Texas at home coming up next weekend. They do. They got to win that Texas series. You got to win, I think, two of those three weekend series. And again, there's a bottom teams, Baylor. And Houston, they're in the bottom, so it's winnable. Got to win those if you want to make the NCAA tournament if you're baseball. It's funny. As we've gone along this season, it's been baseball up, maybe softball down. They switch places. You were there all weekend. Oklahoma comes to town. Where's softball? Softball, ironically, RPI, 33 as of today, just like baseball. They have a much stronger schedule. They go to Iowa State this weekend. The big thing is they got to win that series, probably sweep. Go to the Big 12 tournament in the top six because the top six in the Big 12 tournament, Oklahoma City, get a bye. If they could do all that, I think they're in the tournament. But Oklahoma, they had chances. Uh, you know, game one misleading. Oklahoma pulled away in the seventh inning. You realize UCF and Texas, the only Big 12 teams that did not get run ruled in one game against Oklahoma in a three-game series. Mm -hmm. UCF battled with him within inches of tying the game up with a two-run homer pinch hit in the Saturday game. Sarah Willis was magnificent. Two runs. Seven innings, uh, two hits allowed, best performance by any pitcher in the country against Oklahoma in two years, but just couldn't get that timely hit on Saturday. Then Sunday was home run derby, as we found out. Trace nearly lost his life with all the Nearly died! But um, OU is good, man. They're the best. They're the three-time national champs for a reason, but it's a game of margins, and softball, once again, came up short a couple of those games against Oklahoma. Let me ask you this question, Elo. Uh, Sarah Willis gets the start, pitches magnificently on Saturday. Should have used her more. Maybe a Friday-Sunday split for Sarah. It's a valid question. I think what happened there is she went over 100 pitches against Oklahoma on Saturday. I'm not sure they thought she would go seven. Now, from what I understand, I think if UCF would have had a lead, say, in the third, fourth inning of the game, I think you would have seen Willis in relief. I don't think, though, you, want, you don't want to burn her out right now because you got next weekend, which is critical, and then the Big 12 tournament, where I think you're going to see more of Willis. So. Uh, yes, I understand that. I think she would have pitched if they had a lead in the fourth, fifth inning on Sunday. It just unfortunately didn't work out that way. They were going by committee on Sunday. It just didn't pan out. But uh, I understand that. Got to win some on the road. All right, Elo, Oklahoma, big crowd. It was a great atmosphere at the Plex all weekend long. You've been covering UCF a long time. Most rabid fan base you've seen uh, in a UCF uh, game from the opposing team? Would you call yes. it Oklahoma's strong turnout? Not yes, not just in softball, but any UCF home game. Honestly, uh, it's impressive. There that they uh, there were Oklahoma fans, Trace, that made the trip, paid two hundred and fifty dollars a ticket for a game there at the Plex, uh, which caused some issues because obviously there's no uh, assigned seating uh, except for a few boosters and things. So there were some general admission. So some fans got upset. They showed up a couple minutes late. Man, we I I, I hate I, I've said this on this show a million times. That stadium needs renovations ASAP. Uh, that Once again, over 100% capacity this year for UCF. I don't care what the official box score says. You were there. There was about 12, 1,300 people. When yeah, you a couple hundred people outfields. in the outfield. Yeah, easily. So, yeah. so man, I just – they probably – I wish they would have had more seating. I think they would have made a cash a flow out of it. But, yeah, Oklahoma softball fans, impressive, among the best in the country. I think it's better than any football fan base that's ever uh, played come to UCF. Kansas fan base is really good at basketball. Iowa State, I know you were impressed with Iowa State. I'm going to State throw basketball. you one. I'm going to throw yeah. you one. UConn women's basketball. They brought bus, you know, buses full of people from the villages, a big retirement community. Yes, I say yes. UConn women's basketball, very rabid. All right, let's wrap things up. Bring back in Adam. Adam, what we get right, get wrong. You've been doing all the research. All right, Jacari Brown, uh, gentlemen, if you want some stats on him, 47 to 76, 381 yards, four touchdowns, four interceptions. In his time at Miami, he did have two running touchdowns. Uh, Trace, you said that the Bills were the better run franchise currently than the Patriots. They had to shed $37 million in cap space, including trading wide receiver Stefan Diggs. I'm not so sure that one would be accurate. I did check this out. Uh, you'll be happy to know Sean Peterson did attend the Big 12 Pro Day. He was there. I assume the Bucks were there as well. That's how that works out. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try this, Trace. Uh, the transfer from LaSalle, Rokas Josius. Is, uh, is his name, Rokas Josius. Welcome to UCF. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. One more thing before we go. Elo, I want to thank you right now. 
I know you are trying to keep it a surprise, but I understand that the winning bid for Coach Herb Hand <laughs> making dinner at Gus Malzahn's house went for about eight grand in that kingdom auction. I appreciate you throwing down the money to surprise me with that. I'm looking forward to it. Now I will report back on Around the Kingdom how that goes. Only I know you grand, wanted it badly. Yeah, you owe me. You owe me, have to, you owe me it for multiple reasons, saving your life and that. <laughs> Look for new episodes midweek, every week on the Sons of UCF YouTube channel. And we drop it in the audio feed wherever you get your downloadable podcast content as well. Thank you, Adam. For Eric Lopez, I'm Trace Rolko. Thanks, everyone, for watching this week's Around the Kingdom.